My name is Dr. Stephen Dudikov. I'm a GP here in Caulfield. And um, with apologies to Star Trek, <laughs> science, the final frontier. These are the exploits of the species Homo sapiens. <laughs> Their mission to postulate new theories, to confirm by experiment, to boldly go where no beings have gone before. So now we have mapped the human genome Serious disease prevention can be preconception, and this raises many ethical and religious considerations. So tonight, I hope we can gain some insight into what diseases or test panels we should consider screening for and what options we face once those tests are done. So here at Starfleet Command tonight, we have first up, Dr. Matthew Hunter. Dr. Hunter is Head of Monash General Genetics and an Adjunct Senior Lecturer at Monash University. Greetings, Ethling. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, inviting us to speak. Um, I'm not going to be the first speaker, but I uh, did want to just quickly say a little bit about our department. We're based at Monash Medical Center. Um, we do some outreach clinics and we see a number of different subspecialties within genetics, but mainly we see patients with genetic disorders or family histories of ge genetic disorders. Most people ask me, do you do research? Only in my spare time, because I'm so busy with my clinical load. And that often surprises people, but uh, yeah, it's, it's more common than people realize. But um, again, thank you for having us. And I'll hand over to Ellie, um, who will uh, give the first part of the talk, and then I'll give the second part of the talk. Ellie will be talking about what we currently have, and then I'll be talking about the stuff that we can look forward to in the future. Star Trek stuff. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. So um, Dr. Hunter and I are going to be speaking about um, genetic and reproductive technologies in sort of two parts. The first part being what is actually feasible today in 2017? What can our patients access? Um, and then Dr. Hunter's going to address the Star Trek stuff afterwards. Um, so I guess um, first and foremost, um, I'm a genetic counsellor and my role is to support families in making informed decisions. I don't make decisions for people, but I facilitate um, a decision-making environment where families feel like they can make a decision that's founded on accurate um, information and also based on um, their lived experience and what feels right for them. So everything that we do is rooted in these tenets of practice to obviously always try and first and foremost put the patients first and make sure their decision feels right for them. So genes and chromosomes, I'm sure some people in the audience already know about this, um, but we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and in every cell of the human body we can find these 23 pairs of chromosomes. They're particularly important because they're home to our genes. We have about 20 thousand human genes and they live up and down our chromosomes. So it's particularly important um, that that genetic information is there in the right number and structure to prevent against genetic disease. So much of the technology that's available today is based on looking at chromosomes to try and make sure that all of the right genetic information is there. Um, so I'm going to um, speak about several reproductive technologies but um, based on the premise that we're seeing a couple and they've already been established to be at risk of having a child with a genetic condition. So in order to be able to test a pregnancy, you have to first know what you're testing for. So the, these technologies are not going to be available for couples who have, for example, had a child with a previous genetic condition, but that genetic condition hasn't been diagnosed formally. Um, they wouldn't be able to access these tests. So um, some of the options available to couples are prenatal diagnosis, and I'll talk through what that involves. Um, IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and we'll also address that, as well as some other options, including donor gametes, adoption, um, not having children, taking a chance, and hoping that that condition won't reoccur. But I won't be addressing any of those later options. Um, so what is prenatal diagnosis? It exists in two forms. Um, uh, women can access two procedures. One is called a CVS or chorionic villa sampling and this is where we biopsy the placenta at about 
12 weeks gestation. So that's really the earliest time you can start performing a CVS up until about 14 weeks gestation. And what we do is we extract the DNA from that placental sample and that placenta represents the genetic information in the baby. So if we know that a couple is at risk of having a child with a genetic condition, for example, Tay-Sachs disease, we can actually test um, or extract the DNA from that placental sample and check to see whether the baby carries two faulty genes conferring a diagnosis of Tay-Sachs disease or whether perhaps the baby is just a carrier or doesn't carry any faulty genes. The other way we can test a pregnancy is through amniocentesis and that we do from about 16 weeks gestation um, and it's much the same except that we access amniotic fluid as the sample rather than placental tissue and this is actually considered the gold standard sample for genetic testing in a pregnancy. Um, these procedures carry a risk of miscarriage and this is a really important part of our counselling. So couples need to consider the pros and cons of having a test, a diagnostic test. Um, CVS carries a risk of miscarriage of about 1 in 100 to 1 in 500 and the risk of amnio is slightly lower. There's a long wait. So these women actually carrying this pregnancy up until say at minimum 12 weeks, then having diagnostic testing and then waiting for the test results. So it's by no means an easy process. And then they're confronted with the very challenging decision of whether or not they're going to continue with that pregnancy and if that pregnancy is affected by the genetic condition, then that decision becomes very real. So what other options are there for couples apart from prenatal diagnosis? Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is an option. So what this involves is a couple going through in vitro fertilisation or what's commonly known as IVF, where we harvest eggs and sperm and in a test tube we create an embryo. We grow that embryo to about five or six days and then we extract one or two cells through a biopsy um, and we actually analyse the genetic information in those cells to see whether that embryo is affected by the genetic condition or not. And only embryos that are healthy are then transferred into the uterus to try and achieve a pregnancy. So there are four main reasons why a couple might access um, IVF with prenatal diagnosis or um, pre-implantation genetic screening or diagnosis. So a couple of the reasons might be um, to perform chromosome screening, um, perhaps sex selection, and this is a bit contentious, but we'll discuss this briefly, um, for chromosome rearrangements and for single gene testing. So chromosome screening essentially is like that picture we saw earlier of the human chromosomes, where an embryo would have this chromosome screen performed to try and ascertain whether that embryo has the right number of chromosomes in the right complement. And if so, then that embryo can be implanted and is um, hopefully going to be a healthy pregnancy. Um, but for example, on the right, you can see here, this would be an example of a carrier type or a chromosome complement that, is, um, that constitutes Down syndrome. So performing that screen prior to implanting that embryo can be really helpful in terms of avoiding things like um, transferring an embryo is likely to miscarry because we know that chromosome problems increase the chance of miscarriage or even a pregnancy reaching live birth and then being born with a genetic condition like Down syndrome. Um, sex selection. So in Victoria, the legislation stipulates that a couple can preferentially implant um, an embryo of a particular gender to avoid passing on a genetic condition. So one of the examples, um, a situation in which you might do that is if, for example, there's a genetic condition that's carried on the X chromosome, meaning that males are more likely to be affected by the condition, whereas females can carry the genetic change and not be affected by the condition. So under those circumstances, it is legal for a woman, for a couple to opt to implant, for example, a female embryo in that circumstance. Um, in regards to other um, sex selection criteria, so we, there is actually a patient review, review panel that sits to 
um, assess each case as to whether sex selection will be approved for that couple. But at the moment, they only sit and make decisions in regards to this specific circumstance, which relates to autism. So autism is often polygenic, meaning that it involves lots of genes that are interacting together to result in an autism spectrum disorder. However, often we can't ascertain what the genetic cause is for that um, condition because it's too complex and we don't understand enough about it. So um, couples may preferentially choose to have a female embryo implanted because the incidence of autism among females is four times less than among males. So um, under those circumstances, often the um, patient review panel will approve sex selection for a female embryo. Um, chromosome rearrangement testing and single gene testing. So this is a circumstance where a couple is identified as having a particular, to be carriers of a particular genetic condition or at risk of having a child with a particular genetic condition and we perform testing on um, the embryo for that specific genetic change um, or a, a member of a couple may carry a chromosome rearrangement. So these are structural variations in our chromosome complement and that can result in recurrent miscarriage or children with severe disability. So again, they can use PGD as a, an option to try and avoid that situation. Um, so some of the pros and cons of this technology, obviously um, it's not straightforward. There are no guarantees of actually achieving a pregnancy. In vitro is much harder than naturally. So um, the chances are higher that you'll achieve a pregnancy when trying naturally rather than going through IVF. Um, the more testing you perform on an embryo, the less chance it is of achieving a successful pregnancy. It's not 100% accurate. So even once you achieve a pregnancy and that embryo has been genetically screened, often couples will still choose to perform prenatal diagnosis via CVS or amniocentesis to confirm with as close to 100% accuracy as possible the fact that that um, baby is not going to have that genetic condition. And that's primarily because you can get a lot more DNA from um, a pregnancy that's 12, 14, 16 weeks rather than a single cell or two cells from an embryo. Um, there are also a lot of technological challenges. Um, the woman's going through IVF, which is not a fun process, and she may be otherwise um, fertile, but to create that embryo in vitro, you need to go through that process. It's expensive. There's no Medicare rebate for the genetic testing. There is a small Medicare rebate for the IVF itself. Um, and obviously there are practical factors, timing, and there are no guarantees at the end. There are also no guarantees with pregnancy at the end. Um, so this is, uh, these are essentially the two main options that we discuss with our patients. Um, but I just wanted to briefly mention a new technology that's recently become available and we're using a lot in our clinic, and that's whole exome sequencing. So that's actually the ability to screen or read all of a person's 20,000 genes in a single test. And though we can't perform this in embryos at the moment or in pregnancies at the moment, um, it's probably, we're not too far off being able to do that. Um, but it definitely increases the diagnostic yield in our clinic. So if a patient has a genetic condition or they've got a child with a genetic condition, where previously we may not have been able to reach a genetic diagnosis using this technology, um, we increase our chance of being able to achieve a genetic diagnosis. And what that means is that we then make available to that couple the option of pregnancy testing or pre-pregnancy PGD because we have achieved a genetic diagnosis. So um, we think of our, our genome being like a book and this technology reads the chapters and the sentences within the book to try and find spelling mistakes so I, I thought of a, a shorter missing sentences title or words that might confer talk, a really problem. Um, and if we can achieve a genetic diagnosis, then we well can have a discussion with our patients about PGD and prenatal diagnosis. Words, new technologies used in genetics that can give us from me. And um, now Dr. Hunter's going to talk about the Star Trek. Therapies. <laughs> so Ellie's very kindly given a nice overview of what we can currently do in the prenatal setting. Um, she's talked a little bit about uh, 
whole genome, whole exome sequencing, which is, I guess, a step before testing all of our DNA. Testing our genes uh, makes up about 1% of our DNA, and the other 99% we're still scratching our heads trying to work out. But um, that's coming as well. And um, she's talked about preventing the transmission of a disorder. But is there a way that we can cure genetic disorders? So what if we could fix genetic problems, um, either in embryos, stem cells, in a live person? Um, you know, would that be a good thing? We, we call that gene therapy. So certainly there's a, a concept around this and there's quite a bit of study going into it. Um, but, you know, if you took things a bit further, certainly we, we want what's best for our children. We want uh, to give them the best chance in life. So, you know, what if we could insert desirable traits, um, abilities into our children like uh, intelligence, athletic ability, etc., so that they had a, a really good chance of being successful? You know, is that something that we'd want? And that's more moving into the realm of eugenics and uh, genetic enhancement, and that's not something that the scientific fraternity is quite ready for just yet. So I've broken my talk down into three main technologies. Gene therapy, which really covers all of the technologies, but then I'll go into a little bit more detail in stem, into stem cells and then also something called genome editing, which is a, an exciting new uh, development which um, has the potential to give us uh, lots of potential uh, cures in the future. So how does gene therapy work? Well, the theory is that uh, you can um, take a, a, a cell or a person who's got a genetic disorder where there's a mistake in one of their genes and you can introduce new DNA which then allows you to uh, replace or correct the mistake that that uh, genetic mutation is causing. But how do you get that DNA into uh, the cells or, or a cell? Um, well, we know that viruses can infect cells and that's one way to get it in. And certainly there's a number of different viruses which we can um, co-opt to deliver the DNA into the cell or into the nucleus of the cell, which is the central part of the cell, like the, the yolk of, of an egg. Um, and that's where the DNA lives inside the nucleus. So there are a number of different viral vectors that have been developed. This has been going on since the 90s and uh, researchers have been looking at uh, ways to get DNA into cells in order to uh, do genetic therapy, uh, mainly in animals, not in humans yet. Um, and there are a number of different viruses which can be used. Um, and as I mentioned, you can either do that in a, a, a person who's alive or you can take cells out of them, like blood cells, change them and then give them back to the person and hopefully then they can restore the normal function of that particular gene. Other ways to give um, the viral vectors would be to inject it into the bloodstream or into a specific organ where you want to have that effect. So if you've got a, a liver disorder um, that you want to cure, you could just deliver it to the liver, for instance. Um, so I've mentioned that uh, there's different types of viruses. Uh, the common ones that are used are adenovirus or adeno-associated virus, AAV. Um, they uh, deliver the DNA to the nucleus. However, the other types of viruses um, which uh, are commonly employed are the retroviruses. So HIV is a retrovirus, for instance. And that actually incorporates the DNA into your genome. So it cuts your DNA apart, puts a new piece of DNA in there, and then it stitches it back together again. And that's done in a random fashion. So that's not really that desirable either, but um, uh, can, can be co-opted to, to uh, help you. So by delivering that piece of DNA into the cell, you hope to then be able to make a functional protein which then does the job of that gene and what that gene should have normally done. So hopefully that then fixes the, the problem. But is it safe? Is it reliable? Um, look, this is still considered quite experimental and it's been going on since the 90s. There were some uh, unfortunate failed experiments in the 90s as you can see 
down here, um, the viruses randomly insert DNA and sometimes hundreds of copies into your genome and unfortunately oncogenes get turned on and oncogenes are cancer-causing genes. And so all of the people that were miraculously cured by gene therapy all died of cancer several years later. So um, it was a spectacular success and a spectacular failure. Um, with regards reliability, um, the stability of the DNA that's inserted is uh, sometimes an issue. If you're only putting a little piece of DNA into the nucleus with each cell division, that's likely to be lost. Um, however, it's in, if it's inserted into the genome, then it's more likely to be stable with each um, cell division each time the cell replicates itself. Obviously, if you're using viruses, you can have an immune response and your body's immune system can attack the virus and, and inactivate your gene therapy. Um, with regards to viral vectors, they have variable um, effectiveness. Uh, some are very efficient and can transfect lots of different, uh, you know, high percentage of cells, but they can only do one organ. Others can have, you know, a reasonable coverage across the whole body, but not 100%. So it varies from tissue to tissue um, and virus to virus how um, effective they can be. So this has been done for single gene conditions. Um, so where a single gene causes that genetic condition. However, Mel Ellie mentioned uh, polygenic conditions where there are multiple genetic factors contributing to the development of that disease. And those um, conditions are not well suited to this kind of technology because we don't know how to do multiple genes simultaneously yet. So here are some questions to consider regarding the ethics of gene therapy. Um, I guess the first question is, well, if we're treating someone who we are saying, well, that's not normal, well, what is normal and who defines what normal is? Um, do I determine that Does a support group for a particular genetic condition, like say, for instance, um, the Deafness Foundation, where deafness is not considered a disability but rather a language, you know, is that is that normal? Um, what do we what do we feel about that? Um, you know, how do we feel about curing or preventing disabilities? You know, in particular, what does that mean about the value of the lives of the people that have those disabilities? If we're saying, well, that's not desirable. Um, I guess another question is, is germline gene therapy, um, so that's when you're uh, correcting DNA within an egg or a sperm or an early embryo, um, is that more or less ethical than gene therapy in, say, a child or an adult, so a, a person versus a, a bunch of cells or a single cell? And um, the cost of this technology is quite, quite high. And so that raises the question, well, who's going to pay for that? And then you get access and, uh, and equity issues as well. You know, if uh, people can't afford it, do they get left behind, like in the film Gattaca, if you've seen that? So these are common themes throughout all of the genetic technologies, but some of the other technologies have some special uh, issues associated with them. So I'll touch now quickly on stem cells. Um, so stem cells are cells that have the ability to develop into any of the different types of tissues in the body or just to self-replicate and make more of themselves, as you can see from the diagram. Um, now, there's different types of stem cells. You get embryonic stem cells. So if you imagine a sperm and an egg coming together, forming a first cell of an embryo, that first cell can become absolutely anything in your body. So that's got all that potential. And then as that goes down the line and the body gets bigger and uh, some tissues start to differentiate into, say, blood, muscle, etc., then you get stem cells in those tissues which can become parts of that tissue, like, for instance, in blood, they can become the red blood cells or the white blood cells or the platelets, um, but they can't go back to being a muscle cell or an eye cell. Um, then you get this uh, concept of induced 
pluripotent stem cells. So these are stem cells that have been created from a person's already differentiated cell. So let's say a skin cell which can't go back. You give it a cocktail of uh, genetic factors and you can reverse its development back to being a stem cell that can then differentiate into lots of different types of tissues, not just a skin cell again. So those, that's um, a, a laboratory technique to induce that change in that cell to make it go back to being able to be a stem cell. So I've talked a little bit about uh, pluripotent, where this, the cell has the ability to become anything um, versus tissue-specific cells. And this um, raises the possibility of new um, therapies which are cell-based. And I saw in the newspaper just uh, a week or two ago um, the first um, cell-based therapy that's been um, approved by the FDA. So they take cells out of your body, uh, genetically modify them in the lab, give them back to you to fight your leukaemia. So that, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, we'll see what happens. So cross fingers... Um, it goes well. The other thing that stem cells are very good for, certainly in animals, is, is um, regenerating tissue. So if you've had an injury or uh, damage has occurred to some of your tissue, then stem cells have the potential to replace those damaged or lost cells. So currently stem cells are mainly used in testing medications, so where you've got a drug company that wants to see whether it's safe to give um, that medication to humans, they first test them out on cells. Um, as I mentioned, regenerating damaged or injured tissue, but also replacing tissue. So for instance, if you've got uh, leukaemia and your oncologist has wiped out your bone marrow completely in order to clear the cancer, um, the only way that you're going to survive is if you get a replacement bone marrow that can then replace your blood, so your red cells, white cells and platelets. Now, there's insufficient transplantable organs currently in circulation. If you, can, you, know, if you, if you know what the waiting list is like for a kidney transplant, you would know what a shortage of kidneys there are. So certainly stem cells offer the hope that we can you know, regenerate our own tissues with stem cells one day when we know how to program them to do that. Um, uh, so that they offer a potential there to, uh, you know, uh, take the, the load of uh, uh, organ transplants. And these are some of the conditions um, which are currently being considered as pos possible options, um, medical conditions including uh, slightly non-medical conditions like balding. Um, now, there's um, the, the dogma has always been that um, once a cell, a stem cell has developed a tissue type, so if it's become a muscle stem cell or a, a liver stem cell, it can't go back and become a different organ stem cell. And that's always been the dogma, except that um, recently uh, we found that uh, in, certainly in mice and other experimental animals that maybe some stem cells can uh, be reprogrammed to become something else, or not even reprogrammed, they can just do it on their own. So uh, in this study, um, bone marrow cells were given, injected into a mouse's heart where there was damage and it uh, uh, repaired the, the heart muscle. So, I mean, that would be amazing in, in humans if we could fix... Um, heart attacks, myocardial infarction, where there's a scar in the muscle, um, you could fix that with just giving bone marrow cells from that person. Um, but we don't believe that this is the case in humans yet, although I think the studies still have to be done. So some different ethical questions raised by stem cells are, is it um, ethical to experiment on embryos or embryonic stem cells, which could have become a unique an individual human being. Um, certainly uh, some countries feel that that's a, a step too far and they've banned that. Australia allows that. Um, is it more ethical to do research in induced pluripotent stem cells, so stem cells that have been taken from an adult, like a skin cell, and that's been turned into a, um, a stem cell then? So 
So this is a very interesting technology, genome editing. Um, and this holds a lot of potential um, to help people with rare disorders um, to offer hope for cures. So there are many different types of genome editing technologies. There's a few of them there. Uh, we've got mega nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, talon nucleases. But the one that's probably the most interesting and exciting at the moment is CRISPR-Cas9. So this is um, a technology which is very cheap, it's easy to use, it's very accessible, and it's, it's really um, taking over. It's quite accurate as well. And essentially, the concept is that it allows you to remove faulty bits of DNA and replace them or edit um, uh, existing DNA that's, that's not working properly. It's uh, highly targeted, so it's not like other forms of gene therapy where it's randomly inserted into your genome. You go to exactly the place you want it to go to and, and fix the bit that you want it to fix. And it can insert... Um, genes um, or t uh, pieces of gene into a sequence of DNA where you want it to be inserted. So I hope this isn't too technical, um, but I'll take you through it quickly. Um, essentially, you create something called a guide RNA, which is that little red bit there, which is a template which binds to the part of the DNA in your person or your cell that is uh, where the mut mutation is or the mistake. And then Essentially, once you've got your guide RNA, you bind it to this little yellow blob called Cas9, which is an enzyme which cuts DNA. And what that does is that then that goes and finds the piece of DNA very efficiently, mind you, where you want to make your cuts. It cuts the DNA on both strands, and then that allows you to insert um, a, a new piece of DNA in that cut. And if you make two cuts, you can cut out a faulty section and replace it with uh, a section um, that you've designed to be correct or even you've designed to enhance your, uh, your individual to make them an X-Men or something. <laughs> and, um, and then that, then um, your body just uh, stitches up the two ends then and, and uh, completes the strand of DNA. So it's a very powerful technology. It's highly directable and it's very accurate. Um, and it's being used incredibly widely at the moment. Every conference I go to, almost every talk is CRISPR-Cas9 this, CRISPR-Cas9 that. Oh, we made a mouse using CRISPR. Oh, we fixed this using CRISPR, blah, blah, blah. You get a bit sick of hearing it, actually. Um, and, but it's not only in human research. It's also been used to create um, genetically modified plants for food genetically modified animals, etc. So it's something that's just ubiquitous. And, you know, I think we need to think through what the issues are associated with this because there are risks. There can be some off-target DNA cutting. It's supposed to be very accurate, but um, it can actually do the editing not where you want it to do it if you've got a similar looking sequence or template somewhere else in your genome. Something that ethicists are quite worried about is that you're inducing permanent changes in a person's DNA. And if you put a mistake in there and they were then to reproduce, then they would pass on that mistake to every generation thereafter. And that's um, uh, obviously with various different degrees of penetrance, but this is uh, something that ethicists worry about and I think we should be thinking about. And the scale of use of this technology is quite unprecedented, um, which makes you um, wonder as this uh, becomes the norm, um, then what does that mean if you can't afford it and you can't give your children you know, that leg up and the, those uh, you know, special enhanced abilities, or at least just to take away uh, the conditions or disorders that they might have. So some questions to consider again. Should we or should researchers be allowed to modify stem cells or embryos to correct a genetic condition? Should we be allowed to do it in children or adults? And is that different from doing it in a stem cell or an embryo? You know, is it, in, is it ethical 
to enhance traits such as height, IQ, you know, make you look gorgeous so you can be a movie star. You know, is that something we want? That's not a medical um, uh, use, that's a, a cosmetic use. And as I mentioned earlier, what does it say about how we value people's lives if we're trying to prevent people like them from uh, coming into existence or being born? So I'm going to stop there and thank you for listening. And hopefully that was uh, scientific or science, science fiction-y enough. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I used to work in diabetes a while yes. ago, and I was very interested in type 1 diabetes. You know, uh -huh. People were always asking about how can you minimise the risk in the next generation? Mm. Um, at that stage, it was just a matter of probabilities, um, you know, different genetic makeup and so on, mm. higher probabilities of certain genes and so on. Mm. So for, the question is, ha, has it come? Has that advanced much to make it more predictable? Because the statistics are quite, quite. I mean, it's. I think the son, the, the child of, of someone with type one diabetes, I think it's something like. Um, you know, depending on who it's the mother or the father, I think I remember it to mm. be about, uh, um, it was, uh, I think, one, or one in a hundred, or one in, uh, I can't actually remember if it was Yeah, it's a few percent, yeah. yeah. It's, but it's, it but does, it's, not, it's yeah. not population risk, which yeah. is yeah. a lot lower. Yeah, that's the question. Has it been much about so The second one, is there any, any gene, uh, the gene editing going on in terms of type 1 diabetes? Your yeah, good question. So I'll address your first question and then your second. Um, so the first question, um, are there, uh, what, what is known about the genetics of type 1 diabetes? So we know it's what's called polygenic. So there's multiple genetic factors which each have a small contribution towards you developing diabetes. There's also the and there's environmental, yes. Yeah. So there, there's probably a trigger, like a, an infectious trigger, which then sets off that genetic predisposition. And we know that there's many, many genes, and certainly some of the ones with a bigger effect size we've worked out, but there's likely to be a very long tail of small effect size, um, which we've still got to work out. So um, it's complex, and how it all fits together, we don't know. But um, with complex disorders like type 1 diabetes, which are immune-mediated with environmental triggers, I think we're a long way away from you know, doing genome editing for sure. Um, However, things like stem cells certainly hold much more promise because in type 1 diabetes, you're losing the, pan the pancreatic islet cells in your, your, your pancreas, which produce insulin. And so if you could somehow replace those and stop your body from attacking those ones as well, well, then that would be quite good. Uh, problem is that the immune system will just keep attacking any new cells you put in. But um, there's a lot of work going into it. I don't know enough about it. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of research going into it because it's a common disorder. Type 2 diabetes is even more common and uh, it's got a slightly different genetic architecture, but some of some, a little bit of overlap. Um, but there, I think environment plays a stronger role. And so, yeah, again, very interesting. But there are monogenic forms of diabetes too, where there's just a single gene cause. So there's something called uh, neonatal diabetes, and there's another type called MODI, maturity onset of diabetes in the young. And they're due to single gene causes. And they give us, um, because they're rare, um, we don't see ver them very often, but they do give us r uh, insights into the biology of how diabetes works, and it allows you to, I guess, maybe understand the commoner types of diabetes better. When you're cutting and replacing DNA, how do you do that? With a laser, under a microscope? How do you do that? Like, I, I don't do this. This is, uh, this is uh, the people in the lab, the researchers. I see patients. Um, but um, uh, so um, the, say, for instance, let's take uh, CRISPR-Cas9. So that uh, little CRISPR-Cas9 machinery, that little thing is a protein. 
which is actually, it's developed in bacteria and it's a protection mechanism. They use that to protect themselves against attack from viruses and bacteriophages and things. So what, what um, that does is that cuts um, foreign DNA and cuts it up. Um, and so that's how they use it. And we've co-opted it and changed the templates, et cetera, to allow us to, um, to use it to genome edit. But essentially, you, this, these are tiny little intracellular proteins which you can, uh, I guess, design in a test tube and then give as a, you know, as a, you know, immerse the um, f uh, cells in the fluid of that or, or give it via a, a virus into the cells. So yeah. there's no cutting going? There's no actual cutting and pasting with glue and <laughs> stuff like that. I know the pictures that I've put up uh, are very um, sexy images, but <laughs> it's not how it's done. Yeah, it's, it's a bit more mundane, it's test tubes. Yeah, yeah, so this is what's really interesting. So I think, you know, regulation's trying to catch up because this stuff's going on and there's not a lot of regulation about it at the moment. Certainly, you know, um, bodies like the Human Genetic Society of Australasia is trying to get a position statement out. Um, I think the US has just recently released one that one of their um, bodies was at the um, American Society of Human Genetics has recently released a position statement but I'm not sure there is any regulation yeah um, certainly no one's experimenting on live humans and um, cells yes and mice and poor mice and rats and things but <laughs> but um, not humans yet you know no ethics board would let that through yeah. there's an enormous danger that if there there's enormous danger that, uh, as with that, the, the positives and then the negatives with the cancer we talked about, mm. how there's, surely there's no, there's, there's no certainty that you may not, you know, let the genie out of the bottle and, and in four or five or six or eight generations, you, you cannot be sure that there's not a wild card in there that we yeah. humans aren't smart enough. So that yeah, it's really, a real that risk. really worries me yeah. because down the track, it could be a nightmare. Yeah, certainly with genetically modified um, animals and plants where you're putting, uh, you, you're doing what's called transgenics where you're putting genes from other species into that species. So like, for instance, glowworm gene into tobacco um, so that you can see when it's, it's diseased. You know, those kinds of things are really uncharted territory. Nature hasn't done those. And you're playing God, so to speak. And so the question is, you know, what are the implications? What will, what will happen? And we, we just don't know. There hasn't been enough study of it. And certainly, I'm not even sure we understand the technology very well yet to be able to make an informed decision. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Hmm. Pleasure. Okay. So, indeed. As we've seen, um, the science here is just growing exponentially. And you've raised some very interesting points, some very interesting questions about the ethics. But as Jewish people, we've also got a 4,000 year history of grounding and knowledge and moral base from which to work. So tonight, Rabbi Avraham Jacks, a pulpit rabbi for 15 years and a noted lecturer, can give us some insight into just how we should approach this as Jews. Thank you. So Dr. Hunter's uh, dis discussion about the future possibilities of these technologies reminds me of something that this uh, Jew, Reb Yitz Greenberg, said probably in the 80s. Uh, he said, when I was growing up, an Orthodox Jewish boy from Brooklyn would live and die an Orthodox Jewish boy from Brooklyn. But today, an Orthodox Jewish boy from Brooklyn could just as easily end up a Reform Buddhist woman from Toronto. <laughs> I think today, with these technologies, we go a step back and we could possibly design that um, and make those changes e even at an earlier stage, before birth. Um, there's one... I, I'm surprised the, the science is fascinating. They did such an excellent job of describing it in, in terms that I understood, which is, I'm 
quite impressed by that. Um, but there's, there's one method uh, that, that you didn't touch on, which I thought you would. I mean, if you want children who are athletic, who are handsome, beautiful, charming, geniuses, you could adopt one of mine. <laughs> that's, that's also a possibility. Okay. So we, Dr. Hunter touched on some of the, on some of the ethical issues that, that surround these technologies. And um, what I'll do is I'll just uh, touch on some of them and, and possibly give a, a Jewish perspective about how we would approach this from, from a Jewish halakhic point of view. So the first, or, uh, let's say, set of ethical issues that, uh, that confront us is, uh, as Dr. Hunter characterized it, playing God, um, tampering with the DNA, the genetic code, and the concerns that that arouses. So, I, um, it's interesting to me that a lot of secular uh, bioethicists uh, use this expression, oh, it's playing God, and they don't want to go there. But why would they, why would they not want to, to do, um, so, you, you know, if you don't believe in God, what, what difference is So play God, what's, what's the difference? Uh, well, the answer is because um, I think what they're really saying is that because our knowledge is, is still so rudimentary, and we don't know what the consequences of all of this is going to be. So they worried that if you tamper with these uh, in ways that nature hasn't tampered or, or hasn't produced these results, then you could end up with you know, a zombie apocalypse just as easily as ending up with a um, cure for, for all of these uh, diseases. There's another ethical issue which wasn't touched on here. If we were having this talk in the United States, I'm sure this would have, you would have led with this one. And that's the question or the value of autonomy. So in America, it's a much bigger deal uh, than it is over here in, in, in my experience. But um, autonomy is, is, is considered a very, uh, a very high uh, priority in terms of values when you look at any therapeutic uh, mechanism. So for example, and what autonomy means is that y you need to get informed consent for anything that happens to a person medically. And you can't impose uh, some therapy on a person without their consent. So this is used in the States and, and elsewhere as, as a, a reason to um, allow, or it's an argument to allow euthanasia or, or, or physician-assisted suicide. Because the idea here is you are autonomous. If you want to make a decision about your health, even if that decision is that you want to end your life, that's your business. No one really has a right to legislate and to stop you from, from doing that. Um, it's used as an, an argument not to allow uh, circumcision, uh, religious circumcision. So Briss Miller, uh, because it interferes with the autonomous rights of the child to make their... So in other words, no one would have a problem if a 21-year-old said, I want to be Jewish and um, I want to uh, circumcise myself, um, th that's fine, that's their choice. But an eight-day-old baby uh, doesn't have the ability to, to, to make that determination for themselves, and therefore it could be a violation of that person's autonomy. Vaccinating children would, would fall under the same, uh, the same uh, issue. So people wouldn't, uh, would say that vaccinating a child without them being able to give informed consent is a violation of their autonomy. Of course, we see that certainly with vaccination, there are other issues, uh, the safety of society, et cetera, that, that are uh, higher um, uh, and more important for society. Uh, they, those values or, or those issues trump the possibility of, of, uh, youth aid, of um, vaccinating children. Um, the other uh, issue that was touched upon by Ellie was uh, gender selection. And um, the gender selection has a number of consequences as well that, that impact ethics. Um, in India and China, for example, where, they've, where, where there's a very cheap, easy form of practicing gender selection, there's a mobile, um, uh, they have um, ultrasound clinics, mobile ultrasound clinics that go, and a pregnant woman can go and uh, determine uh, the gender of her child and she can have an abortion on demand. And so basically it takes the 106 to 100 
uh, boy to girl ratio, which is considered typical, um, and turns that in, in China and, and India, for example, that's, that's closer to 130 um, uh, boys to every 100 girls. So it skews the, the population distribution. That's, that's one possible consequence. Another um, issue is that it's a form of sexism. It says that a certain gender is inherently superior to another. And uh, there's obviously serious concerns around that. Uh, there is, uh, there is um, some, and, and here I'll defer to, to, to the experts, but I believe that um, in, certainly in pre-implementation um, uh, diagnosis, when you, when you remove the blastomeres, there, there could possibly, I don't, I don't think that we know of any consequences, health consequences, that could happen to the, to the child subsequently born, but uh, to me it seems that if you uh, remove one or two cells from something that only has six to start off with, uh, there's the, the, there may be some issues that come from there. And then, of course, uh, going from... There is actually a slight, slight increase in birth defects, defects in IVF yeah. babies, especially yeah, when there's been region. Yeah, that makes sense to me. It's just it's logical. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then, of course, there's the uh, slippery slope argument. If you're going to select gender, you might end up into the eugenics uh, issues that... Uh, Dr. Hunter uh, referred to. So let's see what uh, Judaism has to say about this. First of all, um, there's a, a verse in, in, in Genesis which speaks about the fact that Adam, the first man, was placed into the Garden of Eden. And the Torah tells us for two reasons. Le'avdo l'shamra. He was placed there to, le'avdo means to serve the garden, to work the garden, to progress, to enhance the garden. Ulushamra means to conserve the garden, to protect it, to guard it. So if you think about these dual responsibilities that man was given, mankind, was given in the Garden of Eden, was given on this, on this planet, these dual responsibilities uh, temper each other. So on the one hand, we have an incredible uh, ability and even an obligation to further enhance technologies that assist us and, and help us. On the other hand, it has, it's tempered by the fact that we have to conserve what's already there. Um, so, for example, we have uh, a medrash. The, the medrash says that um, at the moment that God created the world, he took Adam on a tour and he showed him you know, the sights and he said, this is... Uh, uh, this is this tree and that tree, and this is this beautiful uh, feature and that feature. And he said, look how praiseworthy this world that I've created for you is. Now, he said, be weary. Don't damage this world because there's nobody who will clean up your mess after you. If you break it, you have to live in it. It's, it's your... So the, there's that requirement that we have to, to preserve and to conserve that which is there, not damage, not cause damage. And, but on the other hand, it's tempered by the um, obligation to, to enhance and promote uh, technology. There's a book that was written um, in the 13th century by an author, uh, who we're not exactly sure exactly who it is, but his name was Reb Aaron Halevi, um, and he wrote a book called Sefer Achinuch. And this Sefer Achinuch is, uh, it takes the 613 commandments of the Torah and it describes uh, halachic, in other words, legal uh, parameters of each commandment as well as some philosophical and ethical issues around there. And uh, the, the prohibition, um, one of the 613 commandments, is that you're not allowed to, to graft species and create new um, genetic strains uh, by taking two existing species and creating... A, a, new, a new species. So he says that the reason, and this, this sounds really modern, he says the reason for this commandment is because we don't know, um, our knowledge is so rudimentary, we don't know the consequences of what we could do with this. And since nature didn't create things, it didn't create these uh, issues, by us interfering, we could cause damage. And so therefore we have a commandment and the, the purpose or the teaching or the message of that commandment is that you have to use, you have to be uh, careful about how you use the, um, how you use those technologies. Now, there's a broader question here, which 
various religions deal with in different ways. Um, and that is, are we allowed to have a therapeutic intervention at all? Who's, who says that you're allowed a therapeutic intervention? Think about it. If God wanted this person to be sick, who, what right do we have to interfere and heal the person? So it's, it's, it's quite an important question. So some religious uh, organizations answer this question by saying, yes, you have no right. And therefore, they refuse to partake in any of the wonderful medical advancements that we enjoy in our modern society. Judaism allows the um, medical intervention, clearly. I mean, how many sons do you want to be a Jewish doctor? You know, <laughs> my mother has one son is a Jewish doctor and one son is a rabbi. And, um, anyway, I won't tell you about the interfamily tensions around that. But um, clearly... There's no problem with having, um, with having uh, medical intervention. The reason is because the Torah says, uh, actually speaking about if two people are having a, a, a fight and they, they cause an injury, that the person um, who caused the injury has an obligation to provide the resources, the financial resources, to uh, pay for the medical bills of his victim who he's, who he's harmed. And the Torah says, You shall surely provide the healing that the victim uh, needs. So if, you, if a person um, caused damage, he has to, he has to uh, provide uh, payment, financial compensation, to make sure that his victim is healed. And the Talmud says, based on that verse, this is the permit, this is the permission that doctors have to heal. The permission and the obligation that they have to heal comes from this verse. So in other words, if this verse did not exist in the Torah, then by Jewish law, the logic would dictate that you would not be allowed to, to heal somebody. But because we have this permission, the permission slip, therefore you're allowed to heal somebody. So. What if it's a non-medical, if it's something that's a non-medical uh, medical intervention? So I'll tell you, give you an example of that. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who's considered one of the greatest um, deciders of Jewish law of, of our time. Uh, he passed away, when I say our time, he passed away actually in 1986. But uh, he lived in, in, for most of his life in the United States. And um, he, he, he grappled in a most incredibly brave way with so many of the great ethical questions of our time. And so that's put Reb Moshe, as he's called, uh, in a very special light within um, Jewish ethical thinking and Jewish halachic thinking. So he was asked a question, if somebody, you know, on Yom Kippur you're supposed to fast, you're not allowed to eat for 25 uh, hours. If somebody cannot fast for medical reasons, they're not able to fast. So then they have to, by Jewish law, they have to eat on Yom Kippur. If a person is required, uh, both a doctor and a rabbi agree that it's medically required that this person not fast, then of course the person has to not fast. We have to preserve life above all else. It's the highest value within Judaism. So therefore, a person wouldn't fast. So somebody came up with this following idea. What if he would take an intravenous drip and put it in his uh, arm, and then he would be fed intravenously. It's not technically eating, but he gets the nutrition, the nourishment that he needs. And so the doctors would sign off on that. And uh, he would actually be fasting technically on Yom Kippur. Is he allowed to? This was the question that they posed, one of thousands of questions, that they posed to Reb Moshe. And this is what he responded. It's very fascinating. He said that the person's not allowed to do that. They should eat. If they're told by a doctor and a rabbi concurs that that, that is that, that based on the doctor's um, uh, diagnosis, the person must eat, then the person must eat. They mustn't, um, because you're doing a medical intervention, but it's not for a medical reason. You're not curing a disease. You're enabling the person to fast on Yom Kippur. Can't do that, says Reb Moshe, um, because the permission is clearly, is only to heal only to provide healing, not for any other non-medical reason. So based on that idea, which is developed at quite uh, length, 
There are some people who say, it's a minority opinion, thank goodness, who say that for this reason, fertility treatment would not be allowed by Jewish law. Because fertility treatment, according to them, is not a medical intervention, but it's using medical mechanisms to, 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 to achieve the result. Uh, Reb Moshe himself and others um, do allow uh, uh, interventions, certain interventions within certain parameters um, for fertility treatment. So anyone who's undergoing fertility treatment, if they are orthodox and observant, they would also um, uh, consult with an, with an expert rabbi in this field. And um, here in Australia, we're lucky we have one of the world's foremost experts in fertility and Jewish law, uh, Rabbi Ullman in Sydney. So we, we, we have um, really um, good access to, to the top minds thinking about this in the Jewish world. So, um, but definitely uh, to enhance y you know, your height or to get blue eyes and blonde hair or anything like that would be considered non-healing. Um, purposes, and therefore I think based on Reb Moshe's uh, thesis, you, it wouldn't be allowed. So in conclusion, if there are medical reasons, and I believe there's over 6,000 single gene disorders that are caused by, medic, by genetic mutations, and as Ellie mentioned, Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, different forms of cancer, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, there's a, there's a host of diseases that, that could be cured um, by this. So within certain parameters, as long as we're not damaging the, the, the that's the standard of the Sefer Chinuch, as long as we're not damaging the world and there's sufficient um, uh, careful uh, studies that, that show that the consequences are manageable, then we uh, would not only be allowed to pursue these avenues, Judaism would encourage us to pursue these, a to, to pursue these av avenues. If, however, they just for... Um, um, they, they, for uh, non-medical reasons, uh, then Judaism would have a lot of, um, would give a lot of pause. I would just like to end with uh, gender selection and just speak uh, very briefly about gender selection um, because that is, as we heard from Ellie, is actually um, something that you could do today. It's not in the realm of science fiction, but it's, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's reality. And um, it impacts, so I'll just, take three examples within Jewish law where it has an impact, a very interesting impact. Um, the first is that one of the 613 commandments, uh, the first actually, is that we have to um, procreate. By Jewish law, we have to have children, uh, be fruitful and multiply. So what is the definition, the minimal definition of being fruitful and multiplying according to uh, Torah law? Does anybody know? One boy and one of each. One of each, one boy and one girl. So let's say you're a real, you know, kosher, orthodox Jewish person. You want to do everything right to the highest standards. You get married. You're very excited. You can fulfill this commandment of being fruitful and multiply. And you, you have a, a, a girl. Born a girl. Okay, very good. Mazel tov, beautiful. Girls are wonderful. I have a few myself, I can tell you. So very good. Then you have another girl. And then another girl, and then another girl, and then another girl. So you, you, you could go your whole life without fulfilling the commandment. Could, would that be a justification to do um, gender selection, to make sure that you have at least one of each, and therefore you fulfilled the commandment? Um, another issue, and this is uh, with fertility treatments. If a person has a fertility treatment, so... Um, so if, if the issue is uh, with the husband and, and he's not fertile, he's sterile, then um, you could, in certain circumstances uh, within Jewish law, you could, have a do you could get donor sperm. Um, but for technical reasons, that donor sperm should come from a non-Jewish donor. Uh, the technical reasons being that there's some very strict uh, laws around marrying very close relatives. So if, um, if you would uh, have a, a non-Jewish donor, uh, then you wouldn't, be, um, you wouldn't enter into this issue of possibly marrying a, a close uh, relative, being that somebody who's, who's not Jewish would be a further uh, relative. Anyway, so what happens if somebody has, um, goes through fertility treatment, there's a, there's a, a, a donor, um, and the child born is a male? So this would not be an issue. There's, there's a set of laws in Judaism called the laws of Yichud, which means that men and women 
um, who are not uh, married to each other or related biologically are not allowed to be alone in a room together. So if you have, um, if, so, so in the case of this fertility treatment where there's a donor, um, a, a male donor, the mother is the biological mother. So therefore there's no issue of yichud uh, for her and if she has a male child or a female child, uh, she's allowed to be in a room with, with, with that child without any restrictions. However, the father, the, um, the, the, the married father, not the biological father, the one who's married to the mother, he's not allowed to be alone in a room with a woman who is not his daughter. So therefore, um, if the child born would be a woman in that case, this could cause problems in a religious household. So therefore, they would, um, there would be a preference to have male children in that case, so that the husband will not uh, have an issue of yichud. And then finally, um, there's a, a, a very interesting case um, about a decade ago in, in Israel uh, that came up. And this case was of a, a, a person a, um, who was a Kohen. And part of the responsibilities of a Kohen in Israel is every day in Israel, a Kohen um, blesses the people as part of the as part of the prayer service, and here in the diaspora outside of Israel, they do so on every yontif, every festival. So what we have here is um, a, a, a couple that were in that uh, he was sterile, and so he um, his wife uh, got permission to to um, uh, to have a child through uh, through a sperm donor who was not Jewish, and that sperm donor, therefore, the child is not a Kohen, because <clears throat> you, only your father, your biological father, passes on that, um, uh, that status to you. It's patrilineal. So the, um, the father was, was concerned that if his wife would conceive a male child, then he would have a lot of explaining to do his whole life, because they would um, ask him to bless, the, uh, to bless the congregation, and his son, obviously, because Fathers and sons go up to bless the congregation if they are um, kohanim. And he would go up to bless the congregation, but his son wouldn't. And then he would have to explain, it's not really his son. It's, well, biologically, you know, it could get... Or uh, the kohen is, is, is given the first um, honor, the first call-up in, in every time the Torah is read. So he would get the first call-up, and you just assume that if the father's a kohen, the son's a kohen. So you'd want to give the son the first call-up, and you wouldn't be able to, and it would be a cause of embarrassment. So he asked if he could have permission to only, um, to only insert female children uh, into his wife, so, so, that the, so that when she gave birth, there would never be this uh, embarrassing question that would haunt him his whole life. Now, none of these cases, by the way, were people doing it because for discriminatory reasons, there was no sexism involved. It was all, you know, rational people, uh, sincere people who are religious and were thinking about this in a very um, detached and logical manner. And in, in all those cases, um, so in the case of the Kohen, he was allowed to have um, Jewish uh, only daughters. In the case of the um, IVF, the, um, the, the preference is to only uh, impregnate female, uh, male, excuse me, male um, um, uh, zygotes so that the, the, there won't be an issue of yichud. And um, in some rare cases, r rabbis have permitted people to, to select gender uh, because of, um, to, to fulfill the commandment of being fruitful and multiply. I'll just conclude with one uh, very brief story. Uh, this story took place at a Shabbat table uh, in Miami. There's a rabbi in Miami, his name is Rabbi Lipsker, and he runs an organization called Aleph, which uh, looks after the spiritual needs of Jewish prisoners in the American prison system. So you can imagine who he's, he has lo lots of interesting friends, you know, colorful friends that he's met through his work. And uh, one Shabbat, he had two um, former in inmates, two former prisoners at his Shabbat table. And they start talking to each other and they tell their life story to, to each other. And it's very interesting. And he's listening to all of this. And this is what they say. So the one who is um, the older of the two gentlemen, he says, yeah, well, this was his life story. He was a doctor, um, and he practiced medicine in the 50s in the United States. And he was extremely successful. He, he had um, started a number of clinics, 
and uh, those clinics were um, were thriving. So he was he was a very uh, wealthy man. Uh, he had a beautiful wife. He had wonderful children, uh, not genetically uh, selected children, but just you know, um, not genetically designed, just naturally beautiful. And uh, he was the president of his synagogue. He was really you know living the American dream, as they say. And he also was performing abortions, which were legal in the 50s in the United States. And so therefore, and he, he was caught, and he was sent to prison. He lost his license to practice medicine, and um, he, uh, he lost his, his wife divorced him. He lost the kids. He lost his wealth. He, you know, he really had a very tough life, even you know, uh, for the rest of his life. And, and he was sitting at Rabbi Lipska's table. So the other guy, the younger man, he says, oh, well, I have a similar story to you also, you know. Um, I was uh, the top of my profession, which was, uh, which was um, uh, he, he traded in stocks. And uh, he said he did very well. He also had, you know, the, the wife, the, the white picket fence, the house, uh, the prestige of the community, the well, everything that the, the other doctor had. And in, in the 80s, he was caught practicing insider trading. Okay. And so he went to jail and lost his wife and lost his kids and the family and the prestige and all that. So they were talking to each other and they came to an incredible conclusion. They said their problem was not the crime that they committed. The problem was the decade they committed it in. Because in the 50s, that's how you did business. You know, there were cigar smoke-filled back rooms, and if you knew something, like if you had real intel on a, on, you, you were a hero. You know, you, you were held up as being, as being a hero. Um, and in the 80s, if you performed an abortion, the government wouldn't, not only it wasn't illegal, the government would protect you. And they would, um, they, in front of abortion clinics in the States, there's state funded or government funded protection that they that they place there so it wouldn't so in other words not the act that they did there was nothing intrinsically um, wrong or right about the act it's the decade they did it in so had this one person lived in the 50s you know his outcome would have been different and had the doctor lived uh, practiced medicine in the 80s his outcome would have been different and I hear, I think, um, and the reason I conclude with this story is because it, I think it really um, puts into, into place the Jewish view on ethics. And that is that because you saw how I approached all of this, started from the Torah, quoted uh, sages, you know, middle, both from the 13th century and a more contemporary um, Jewish thinker. And this is where we come from. We come from um, an absolute vantage point. So there's an absolute ethical value system that underlines the Torah. And it doesn't matter what's popular, what's not popular. It doesn't matter what the trend is. It doesn't matter um, necessarily what, the, what modern ethical thinking is. What matters to us as Jewish ethicists is to look at what the sources say. What is this absolute value system? And how can we um, impose this absolute value system on the great questions that we're grappling with today. And we come from a, a place where, where, that, where, where we speak in absolutes in, in Jewish law, which, which, is, which, is not, um, which is not the place or, or, or the style of, of science and uh, to speak in, in terms of absolutes in any, in any field. That's bad science when you speak in absolutes. Science should always be questioning uh, itself and should always be uh, looking to, to open new vistas and new frontiers. And what we do is, uh, it's, it's, it's very, um, in a way, it, it's, 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 a, it's a nice secure feeling, you feel warm and fuzzy, that we have um, very strong background uh, to, to base our ethical discussions around some of these issues and that they have a lot to say and to inform uh, the discussion that that we're having, and that they're not going to shift, but that that we can rely on them to be generation after generation the same ethical values and to have relevance and meaning in a very fast changing world, which is creating uh, many new and e exciting technologies and bringing along with that some um, serious questions that we need to consider. Thank you.
I wanted to ask um, what the Jewish perspective would be on preventing disease. So, for example, a family where there's no history of any genetic conditions, uh, but the, the couple might choose to do a test that could see if their carriers were at risk for any um, of those many genetic conditions that you mentioned. Um, and I guess then that raises the possibility that they can use the technologies that Ellie mentioned um, to potentially find out if a pregnancy is affected with it or um, an embryo going through the embryo way. And I, I guess I'm interested in the Jewish perspective on, on using that technique to prevent disease, but where it results in the termination of pregnancy. Right. Um, yeah, th thank you for asking that question because it was something I actually <laughs> thought about when Ellie was, was talking. So the prenatal uh, diagnosis, the Torah would probably, um, Jewish law would probably say that you should not uh, engage in that because we, we're very limited with, with, the, um, with the possibilities of, of how we could manage that. So um, in other words, the, in, within Judaism, Abortion is allowed in certain circumstances, um, mainly uh, if the child is posing a threat to the mother's life. Now, there is um, one rabbi, the Tzitzel Eliezer Rabbi Waldenberg, who quite controversially said that raising a special needs child or a child that suffers from Tay-Sachs or, or what have you could be potentially um, harmful to the mother's health because the mother could... Uh, become suicidal uh, over it in an extreme, in extreme case. But uh, that's a minority opinion. I think uh, mainstream Jewish thought is that uh, you, you cannot really terminate a, a pregnancy if the child is, um, b because the child will, will, have some, will have some disease. So um, pre-implementation diagnosis, that's very exciting from from a Jewish uh, perspective, because we could really stamp out diseases like Tay-Sachs. I mean, that, that could, you know, we could read about that in the history books uh, within just a very sh few generations. We already are practically there, yeah. Um, so when, um, you know, the Dar Yasharim, I don't know if you're familiar with that organization, Dar Yasharim does testing on Jewish people. Um, it's a blood test, uh, and they test for Tay-Sachs. And when they started their testing in the, in the 80s, it was uh, quite controversial. Um, people had to work through it. But today, it's almost, um, I mean, uh, you know, in, in all Jewish day schools, they offer this testing. And it has uh, reduced the, the, the amount of, of Tay-Sachs uh, incidents really dramatically in the Jewish, in the Jewish population. So that, there's nothing wrong with that. Also, um, if, you, if you create multiple zygotes in, in using one of these therapies, um, Judaism would, wouldn't have any um, issue with um, discarding those zygotes that it doesn't consider. So therefore, if, if, the, if there were some zygotes that, were, that had the disease, whatever it was, um, there wouldn't be a problem not implementing, not, uh, not uh, transferring them. Um, you spoke before about some of the issues that arose with, um, with the, if the husband, for instance, was sterile and had to get a donor sperm and some of those yihud issues. Um, what about um, if, the, if the woman um, has egg issues and then you're looking at a donor egg? Yeah. Yeah. But is the mother the carrying the baby yes. to term? Oh, no, then there's no issue whatsoever. Uh, sorry, if, if it's a surrogate mother, um, that, then that would be... Yeah, no, no, no problem. That would be considered by Jewish law. The mother would be considered the biological... Like, have the same status as a biological mother. There would be no problem with yichud, so she could have male or female children. It's only... In that case, it would only be a problem if the husband is sterile. Just very quickly, I think you... There's a bit of a circular argument because you said that you, as long as it can be proven medically that there's no harm, um, playing around with gene splice, whatever you want to call it, then, okay, go, go ahead. But the problem is, we can't prove that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, which is the first time in history, because all of the other stuff had a limit, had, there was a limit, there was a limit to how far you could go. But now we're getting so close to tinkering with the very foundations, the very structure, of everything, you know, of life, that we just don't know. Now, it's not in human nature 
to stay awake. You know, we always want to get involved and do things and play around and our thirst for knowledge and it. But I think we're coming to a point where it may, where we, we actually have to say no, we're not gonna eat this ice cream, you know, we're not gonna play with this, it's just off. But I don't think we will, and I think that's where the problem lies. I don't think Judaism would want us to stop playing, to stop eating the ice cream. I think that um, Judaism would encourage us to go. Okay, so that's uh, so you know there are a lot of there are a lot of risky therapies, right? Well, there are a lot of risky therapies, um, risky to the individual patient. Correct, limited, yeah. So there are a lot of there are a lot of risky uh, therapies, and Judaism has very well defined, well established criteria for when the risk becomes worth the reward, and the same would apply here on a grander scale, albeit. But <laughs> let me tell you that today you have um, eaten tons of genetically modified food. Probably everything you've eaten today has been genetically modified, more or less. So, um, you know, th that cat's out of the bag. That's, that's decades old technology. And people were very concerned when that technology started on. People still are very concerned with the possible consequences that we don't know that could come from, uh, from, from that uh, interference in the genetics. But on the other hand, we're feeding um, much larger populations of people than we've ever been able to feed in the world, and so it's brought a lot of good. And I think it's a, it's a risk reward, and you've got to balance it, and you've got to, you know, go, as best as you can, try and figure out all of the consequences. And then there comes a point where uh, it becomes ethically, it becomes unethical not to to proceed down these lines. I mean, if you've ever uh, you know, if you know what Tay-Sachs does to, 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 a, to a child, I mean, there's no, and, and many of these diseases, they, they're so serious and the suffering is so acute, and if, if there's a chance that we could, we could stamp that out and cure it, we have an obligation to go down that road. Not in an irresponsible way, for sure, but in the most responsible way that, that we can. And then in the end, there's, there's a principle um, which the Talmud says, Shem Epsoim Hashem, which is that in the end, God looks after us as well. God looks after the innocent. And we're going through this, we're developing these technologies, and, um, you know, we, we believe that, that, uh, that God gave us these brains to develop these technologies. He gave us the commandment in the Torah to develop these healing technologies. We have to do it, and if we're going to do something that's going to really... Um, you know, be very damaging to the world, God will step in and he'll, he'll, he'll change uh, the way that the, <laughs> the world works so that it won't be damaging and he'll protect us like he's protected us from everything. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank again our three wonderful speakers. Fascinating topics. Uh, could have really gone on for hours. So again to Matthew Hunter and Yael Prower from Monash University. Um, Dr. Rabbi Abraham Jacks for his great insight from the Jewish perspective. And just a little plug as well, and for Nikki, a genetics counsellor who now works at the Genetic Clinics Australia, which is actually now co-located co with Travel Clinics Australia here in Glen Eye Road, Caulfield, if anyone wants to go locally. Okay, so thank you once again. <laughs>